temperature scales. Now, in chemistry, we don't use the Fahrenheit scale. There's a lot of problems with the Fahrenheit scale that I won't go into, but uh, which is why almost no one uses the Fahrenheit scale except for the United States and maybe a few other small countries, but most of the world uses Celsius. Now, degrees Celsius is what we see the most often in chemistry, but it's not the base SI unit for temperature because it has a problem. Celsius can be positive or negative. So negative 20 degrees Celsius and positive 20 degrees Celsius are obviously very different temperatures. But if we're doing a calculation with it, say we're multiplying by temperature for some reason, in both cases we would multiply by a factor of 20. And that can be problematic. So we have a different temperature scale that we use called the Kelvin scale. This is the absolute temperature scale because it cannot be negative. The lowest possible temperature is zero Kelvin, referred to as absolute zero. To convert from Kelvin to Celsius, the factor is 273.15. And you typically, typically just take whatever your degrees Celsius are and add 273.15. So for example, if you had a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, which is of, often considered room temperature approximately, you add 273.15, and this would give you a temperature of 298.15, and this is in Kelvin. Not, ke not degrees Kelvin, but simply Kelvin, which is an uppercase K. And this is the base SI unit for temperature. Now, if you're first given Fahrenheit, you'll first have to convert to Fahrenheit. And if you are unfamiliar with converting between Celsius and Fahrenheit, your textbook does an excellent job of going over how to do that. But we're going to move on to the more chemistry-specific conversions. So normal human body temperature can range over the course of the day from about 36 degrees Celsius in the early morning to about 37 degrees Celsius in the afternoon. Express these two temperatures and the range that they span using the Kelvin scale. Notice that this is boxed in red and says sample problem 1.1. If you're following along with your textbook, sample problem 1.1 is shown in your textbook in chapter 1. Now, you can follow along. It's the same solution. At the end of sample problem 1.1, however, in your textbook that is not in the slides, there are sample problems or practice problems, A, B, and C. Please focus on sample problem A and B after, or e practice problem A and B after every sample problem. These are the problems that I look at when I'm doing your homework and I'm doing your tests and I'm making this. These are the kind of questions that I expect you to know how to do, how to calculate. Practice problem A is almost exactly like a sample problem for any of these sample problems in the textbook, just maybe with the numbers changed or maybe the uh, chemicals changed when we get later on in the chapters. Sample problem B, on the other hand, is usually a similar problem but worked in reverse. So when we get to the density problems and it says, given this mass and volume, calculate the density, sample problem B or practice problem B may be the reverse. Given the density and the mass, go backwards and find the volume. So focus on being able to do both of those problems. So if you would like to, working along with the textbook, pause the video after the sample problem, and go ahead and work out those two practice problems. The answers to the practice problems are in the back of the chapter, not the very back of the book, but the back of the chapter. Unless you're, of course, using the ebook, in which case the solutions uh, to the practice problems, you just hover over the question and it will give you the solution there. So. Moving on with this problem, it wants us to convert 36 degrees Celsius and 37 degrees Celsius in Kelvin. It also wants the range, meaning how much do they differ. So to convert, we just add 273.15, and we'll see that uh, And they rounded using snippet figures. We'll talk about that later, why they didn't leave on the 0.15. And they get 309 Kelvin for the first temperature and 310 for the second temperature. These two differ by one unit or one Kelvin. As you'll notice, our original degree Celsius also differed by one degree Celsius. So the range is the same for both Celsius and Kelvin scales. On the other hand, Fahrenheit range is not equivalent to the range of one for a Celsius, which is why we don't use Fahrenheit very often. 
All right, so I mentioned uh, units, SI units. Notice you saw one for length, you saw one for mass. You did not see one for volume. That's because volume is actually a derived unit. When we first learned about volume way back in uh, elementary school, you learned about it probably in terms of geology geometry. You had, to say, a cube, and you wanted to know what the volume of this uh, cube was. And we found that volume is length times width times height. So if I have a cube, you'll have to bear with me with my drawing skills here, I have some sort of a length, some sort of a width, and some sort of a height to this. And my volume was length times width times height. Now, all of these are measured, if we are was measuring this, with a ruler. So they're all technically lengths. The height is just the length of the vertical. The width is the length of this side. So these are all lengths. The base SI unit for length is a meter. So a meter times a meter times a meter would give us a meter cubed. And this is the derived, because it's derived from base SI units, derived unit for volume is a meter cubed. However, this isn't very practical in most laboratory settings. I mean, if you think about how long a meter is, picture a meter stick in your head. It's a little bit longer than a yardstick. And then picture a, say, a packing box that is a, whole, a meter long, a meter wide, and a meter high. That's a huge box. That's not very practical volume to use in laboratory settings because we tend to not fill up boxes of that size with chemicals. So this is even though it's the base SI unit, it is not the practical unit you most commonly will see in laboratory exercises. The more commonly un used, you'll see, is the liter. Now, one liter is a cubic decimeter. So a deci, deci means one-tenth, or one-tenth. If this was a, a decimeter, that would be one-tenth of a meter. So picture a meter and divide it in ten, and this is the length here. So if I take a cube that is one decimeter, in height, width, and length, that would give me a liter. So one liter is equal to a decimeter cubed. Now if I took one-tenth of a decimeter, that would give me a centimeter, or one-hundredth of the whole meter. One-tenth of a tenth is one centa, or one centimeter here. One centimeter is equal to one milliliter. One centimeter cubed, sorry, is equal to one milliliter. So the big takeaway here is that one liter is equal to one decimeter cubed, and one milliliter is equal to one centimeter cubed. So these conversions you'll see, these units used interchangeably. If you've ever worked in the uh, medical field or you're filling up a syringe or volume, you might have her seen the volume CC say, you know, the patient needs 10 cc's of a, a drug. Cc stands for cubic centimeter, so this is the same thing. A cc and a cubic centimeter and a milliliter are all actually the exact same unit. Density is also a derived unit. Density is the ratio of mass to volume. So here's an equation. Density is equal to mass over volume. Notice it is highlighted in yellow. Whenever we have a formula highlighted in yellow, if you refer back to your textbook, you'll see that this is also listed in your textbook as a formula. And at the end of the chapter, it has a list of all the formulas that were noted in your textbook and highlighted. So the density formula, we can use units of grams for the mass and milliliters for the volume. And this is typically the unit you'll see when we're dealing with liquids is grams per milliliter. It's just the same as a gram per centimeter cube, since earlier we said centimeter cube and milliliters are the same. And just this is the unit we typically use with solids, since solids are typically measured using their length, width, and height. Now, it, gases are far less dense than solids or liquids. That's why you know, air tends to float above. Liquids and solids tend to sink down. So instead of using grams per milliliter, we typically use grams per liter when we're measuring the density of a gas. So let's do a little problem here. Ice cubes float in a glass of water because solid water is less dense than liquid water. That's pretty unique. Most solids are more dense than the liquids of their same state. 
the question asked us to calculate the density of ice given that at zero degrees Celsius, a cube that is two centimeters on each side has a mass of 7.36 grams. So let's look at A first. Now, part is part of chemistry probably is not the math, because the math in this is very rarely going to go anything higher than basic algebra, really. It's looking at a word problem and picking out the word problem, figuring out what numbers are pertinent, are they in the right units, what formula do I need to use, where does it go in the formula. Once everything's in the formula, then solving it's usually pretty easy. So let's look at this word problem. We're given three numbers here. We're given a temperature, zero degrees Celsius. We're given a uh, length, two centimeters, length of a cube, and we're given a mass, grams, and we're asked for the density. Now when you see the word density, it helps to go ahead and real quickly write what is the formula for density. Well, the formula for density is density is equal to mass divided by volume. So I need a mass. Was I given a mass? Yes, I was given a mass, 7.36 grams. So we know that's what goes right there, is 7.36 grams. But we need a volume. We're not given a volume, but we are given that is a cube that is two centimeters on each side. Now. We learned a long time ago, hopefully, how to find the, the volume of a cube from its length. Length times width times height, and then by definition, a cube is the same on all sides. So length, width, and height are each two centimeters. So the volume of this cube would be two centimeters for our length times two centimeters times two centimeters, length times width times height. So 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8, so we'll get 8. Now here's another uh, trick that I see students messing up on, is they multiply or divide, or whatever they're doing here, the numbers, but they don't change the unit. The unit is also being multiplied here, centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. So that centimeters cubed is our unit here. So that would be our volume, what goes on the bottom here. So we have 7.36 grams on the top and 8 cubic centimeters on the bottom. So dividing these two numbers here, will give us 0.092 grams per centimeter cubed, which is the same as a gram per milliliter. So that's part A. Part B then asks us to using that uh, density, determine the volume occupied by 23 grams of ice, still at zero degrees Celsius. Notice we never actually used zero degrees Celsius in the first problem. Sometimes there's numbers that are given there that are given for your information. Now in this case, the reason they specify is because density varies with the temperature. If the lower the temperature, that could change the density. So it's specified, but it's not actually used in our calculation. So just because a number is given a problem does not necessarily mean it has to go into your calculation. In this case, it, the temperature did not go into our calculation. So don't be alarmed if you see numbers that end up not actually going into your calculation. So this asks for the volume. Determine the volume given this mass and ice at zero degrees Celsius, which means given the density, using the density we just calculated. So we're looking for volume, which means we need to rearrange our formula. Density is equal to mass over volume, and we need to rearrange it to solve for the volume. So if I rearrange it, I will get the volume is equal to the mass divided by the density. So rearranging a simple equations is a skill you should have learned in early algebra. If you're having trouble with it, again, go to the Math Tutorials tab on Blackboard, and there's an excellent tutorial there on rearranging formulas that will help you with this. So we take the mass given, 23 grams, divided by the density we calculate in part A, and we will get 25. Now let's look at the units. For part A, the unit was gram on the top, centimeter cubed on the bottom, so we end up with a unit of gram per centimeter cubed. Here, our unit is gram on the top, gram per centimeter cubed on the bottom. Now, you should have learned early on, if we have a fraction that has the same thing on the top and the bottom, then those two things will cancel out. So grams, in this case, the same on the top and the bottom, it cancels out. Centimeter cubed. 
I, it's on the bottom of a fraction here. Dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by its reciprocal, which means the centimeter cube will come up to the numerator, come out of the denominator and come to the numerator, because I'm dividing by 1 over it, which is the same thing as multiplying by it. So 25 centimeter cube to 25 milliliters is the answer to part B here. And this is how to calculate density and calculate volume, or you could also do the same thing, solve for mass using the same equation. So that's it for section three. Moving on to section four. Section four doesn't have any math. This is physical properties, chemical properties, and intensive and extensive properties. Now, you may be probably already familiar with the terms quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative meaning dealing with numbers. But physical and chemical you may not be quite as familiar with. So a chemical property is one that deals with chemical changes. Chemical changes are ones that change the identity of the substance. The, whereas physical properties do not change the identity of the substance. Physical changes pretty much are things like uh, just changing the state of matter, going from a solid to a liquid, aka melting. If I had solid ice, which we know is ice, or solid water, ice, and I melted it, it became liquid water, but it is still water. Water is H2O. I did not change it. It's still H2O, whether it is a solid or a liquid. Melting it did not change the identity of that compound. Therefore, melting is a physical change, and properties dependent on that, such as melting point, the temperature at which water will melt, is a physical property. Chemical properties are ones that carry that are a chemical change. They change the identity, such as if I had a piece of paper and I wanted to measure the temperature at which it will combust or burn. I can do that by heating up the paper until it catches fire and burns and measuring at what temperature it did that. That would be its combustion point. But at the end of that process, I no longer have paper. The paper has been chemically changed into a different compound. So combustion would be a chemical property. And combustion, the combustion point would be a chemical property and combustion would be a chemical change. Extensive versus intensive properties. Extensive property are ones that depend on the amount of matter, whereas intensive do not depend on the amount of matter. I picture a glass of water, and I pour half of the water out. Any property of that water that changed because I poured half of it out would be extensive, whereas any property that did not change would be intensive. So I pour half of it out, things that change. Mass would change, certainly. I would have less mass of water. Volume would change. The volume of the, ch of the water would decrease after I poured it out. Now, things that would not change, density. Water at about room temperature has a density of about one gram per milliliter. It doesn't matter if I have a cup of water or a gallon of water or a milliliter of water. Its density is intensive. It does not depend on how much water I have. Temperature. If I took the temperature of that glass of water and then I poured half of it out and took the temperature again, the temperature would not have changed. So that's another example of an intensive property. So to determine between extensive and intensive, just picture what changes if I were to remove some of my substance. And those are my extensive properties. Let's move on to significant figures next. Significant figures and knowing where to round. First, let's talk about uh, exact versus inexact, the term exact numbers and inexact numbers. An exact number is a number that has limitless, ex uh, it has no error. There's no error in it. It has no sense of, okay, well, I'm only significant out to a certain number of digits. Exact numbers come about two different ways from defined values, such as one inch is defined as 2.54 centimeters. This is the definition of an inch, 2.54 centimeters. So 2.54 is a exact number. We also have the defined numbers in the 
uh, prefixes such as kilo means 1,000. This number 1,000 grams per kilogram when I'm using 1,000 in terms of how many uh, kilogram, grams in a kilogram, that is a defined value. So it's an exact number. You can also get exact numbers from counting whole objects. If I were to count out 12 marbles, I have exactly 12 marbles. There's no possible amount of error there. I don't possibly have 12.01 marbles or maybe 11.99 marbles. I'm counting whole objects, so I have exactly 12 objects. So those are the two ways of getting an exact number, and exact numbers have limitless significant figures in them. Any other method than counting, counting whole objects are inexact numbers. So if I measure the length of something using a ruler, or I put an object onto a balance and measure its mass, or I use a stopwatch to measure how long it takes a marble to hit the ground when I drop it, those are all ways of measuring, and those will all yield inexact measurements. Now, even if you're not the one doing the measurement, there are there's still, if they were measured, they're going to be inexact. For example, if I said, okay, there are 365 days in a year. Well, how do we know that? Is a year defined as 365 days? No, actually a year is defined as the length of time it takes for a specific occurrence to be completed. In the case of here on planet Earth, one year is how long it takes the Earth to revolve around the sun. Now, that takes really 365 point some decimals amount of time to for the Earth to revolve around the sun one time. Uh, but no matter how many decimals out you go, that was still measured. At some point in time, some scientist measured how long it took for the Earth to complete one orbit around the Sun. So that was a measurement, not a definition. So that would be an inexact number. However, one hour is not measured as 60 minutes. It is defined as 60 minutes. So this is where I see students getting uh, confused the most. Reaching exact and inexact numbers is with time. Time can be defined or it can be measured. Time defined, definitions of time are 60 seconds and one minute, 60 minutes and one hour. However, if time is defined rather by a measurement, such as a day is how long it takes for the Earth to rotate on its axis, that's about 24 hours, but that's actually a measured value not a defined value. So whether or not time is defined by its measurement or defined by uh, an occurrence like the Earth rotating or the Earth o orbiting around the Sun will tell you whether or not it's an exact, such as 60 seconds in a minute, or an inexact, such as 24 hours in one day. So. Once you've determined that you have an inexact number, say you are the one who took the measurement, how do I know how many of those numbers to record and consider significant? Significant figures are the meaningful digits in any reported number. Let's say I am measuring the length of this flash disk here. And I have two different rulers. Both of these rulers are measuring in metric. They're both measuring in centimeters. But the graduations are different. Well, the first ruler has a graduation for every whole number centimeter. The second one has a graduation for every tenth of a centimeter. If I count, there will be 10 tick marks in between the 1 centimeter and the 2 centimeters. So every tenth of a centimeter or 0.1 centimeter has a graduation. So how do I know where to measure? The rule is you always estimate one more digit than you have a graduation for. So let's say I'm taking a measurement using the top number here. The top ruler, I have a graduation for every whole number centimeter. And the flash drive is definitely at least two centimeters. So that two is not estimated. 
Now, I do not have a graduation for a tenth of a centimeter up here, but I can estimate it. I can look here and go, okay, I'm about halfway in between the two and the three. So I'm going to estimate the tenth place. I'm going to estimate this. This is my estimated or uncertain digit. Uncertain digit. Sorry, the pen's wanting to go everywhere all over the page here. So the uncertain digit. Now here is the uh, trick that a lot of students get confused with. They think that because this was estimated as an uncertain digit, it is not significant, and that is not true. This is still a meaningful digit. So even though it's the uncertain, the estimated digit, it is still significant. So if I were to look at this number, I would say that this number, 2.5, got to have a unit, centimeters, has one, two significant figures. I'm going to shorthand significant figures as sig figs, sig fig, significant figure. All right. Now, say instead I measure the exact same flash drive using this ruler down here that has a graduation for every tenth. Now, let's see. The two definitely at least two centimeters long, so we've got the two. Now the first place after the decimal, the tenth place, I have a tick mark for that. Let's see, I've got 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, it doesn't look like it quite reached the 2.5, but I've definitely at least hit the four. So that four is going to be a certain digit. But I can't just say, okay, 2.4 because I didn't estimate anything. That 4 was not estimated. There was a graduation for it. You must have, when you're taking a measurement, and take note of this because when you're doing this in lab ex exercises, I'm looking for the number of digits you have in your measurements, and I know what in your lab kit, uh, what the graduations are of your ruler and your graduated cylinders and such, so make sure you're recording the correct number of digits here. So I'm going to have to estimate. Now looking at this, it didn't quite hit the 5, uh, but it's pretty close. So I'm going to estimate, say, 8, pretty close there. I'm going to estimate the hundredth place as an 8 here. Now your estimated digit and my estimated digit might be a little different. You might look at that and say, oh, that's definitely 9. And your friend might look at it and say, oh, that's definitely 7. But that's fine. There is some level of error in here. That's fine. That does not mean it is not significant. You are the person taking the measurement. So you made this estimation. You made this judgment call. That means it is significant. It is uncertain. There is some possible level of error in there, but it is still significant. So 2.48 centimeters. And this would have one, two, three sig figs, significant figures. So the number of significant figures in these numbers depend on what instrument was used to take that measurement. So what if I'm just looking at a number that's already been reported for me? How do I tell how many significant figures are there? Well, we have rules to determine that. The first rule is pretty easy. If I have any number, say 112.1, point, any number that is not zero is always significant. So I would have one, two, three, four significant figures in this number. Rest of the rules deal with what if it is a zero. When are zeros significant and when are they not? Sometimes zeros are significant, sometimes they aren't. So pay attention to the rules to determine. The first rule says that zero is located between non-zero digits, so in the middle somewhere, sandwiched between non-zeros, are significant. So 305, 305, this zero is sandwiched between non-zero digits, so it counts as a significant digit. So I would have one, two, three significant figures. 50.08, these two zeros are sandwiched between, they are significant. One, two, three, four significant figures. All right, zeros to the left of the first non-zero digit are not significant under any circumstances. These are actually just placeholders. So point zero, zero, two, three. These three zeros 
do not count as significant figures. So I only have two significant figures. 0 0.000001 has just one significant figure. Now the reason why these are not significant figures is I said they're displaced holders. What does that mean? That means if I were to rewrite these in scientific notation, those zeros would disappear. So let's try this real quick. Let's rewrite point 0.0023 in scientific notation. So that means we move the decimal until there is one non-zero to the left here. So I had to move this decimal one, two, three times. So I'm going to rewrite this as 2.3 times 10, and because I had to move it three times, negative three. Notice now that it's written in scientific notation, and we agree, if we understand scientific notation, these are the same amounts. This is the same number. But it's clear when I wrote it this way, there are only two significant figures there. That's why zeros to the left never count. It's because when you write in scientific notation, they disappear. They, they're just placeholders. All right, so what if the zero is to the right? Here's where the rules split again. Zeros to the right of the last sentence, so on the end, are significant if the number contains a decimal point. Now it does not matter where this decimal point is. That does not have to be on the end. It can be anywhere there. If there's a decimal anywhere, we get to count the zeros on the end. So 1.200, because I have a decimal, those zeros get to count. So one, two, three, four significant figures. What if there's no decimal place? Well, then it's ambiguous. You don't know. 100, for example, may have one, two, or three significant figures. It's impossible to tell without being given more information. So whoever wrote that number, took that measurement, should have given you more information. Say you are the one taking the measurement, and you want to show that this number has, say, just two significant figures. How can you do that? Well, that's where scientific notation comes into play. So if they're ending at the zero and you don't have a decimal, use scientific notation so you can put a decimal in there. So for example, if I had uh, the number 130. If I wanted to show this number 130 had only two significant figures, I would write in scientific notation as 1.3 times 10 to the second. If I wanted to show that it had three significant figures, I would write it as 1.30 times 10 to the second. Now we see that all three digits are significant. So let's go ahead and count significant figures for a couple of examples here. Determine the number of significant figures in the following measurements. 443 centimeters. Well, that's pretty easy. One, two, three significant figures. 15.03. This zero is sandwiched in between, so it counts. One, two, three, four significant figures. 0 0.0356 kilograms. These zeros are leading zeros, which means they do not count under any circumstances. So we're going to ignore them and skip straight to the first non-zero. One, two, three, this number has three significant figures. 3.000 times 10 to the negative three, seven liters. There is a decimal, this one's written in scientific notation, there is a decimal, so these zeros on the end get to count. One, two, three, four, there are four significant figures in this number. 50 milliliters. Well, there's no decimal here, but there's a zero on the end. We don't know. So I would say that E is ambiguous. It might have one, it might have two. We need more information to answer that question. For F, 0 0.9550 meters. The leading zero doesn't count. Remember, leading zeros don't count. The zero on the end, however, does get to count because there's a decimal. So I have one, two, three, four significant figures in this measurement. All right, now that we know how to count the number of significant figures, let's figure out how to round. So we're going to look at this first just with simple math problems, just leaving the chemistry out for a little bit here. So the rules for where to round differ depending on whether or not you are doing an addition subtraction problem or a multiplication division problem. Let's look at the first rule. The first rule is if you're doing an addition or subtraction. Now this actually has nothing to do with significant digits. Addition and subtraction, on the other hand, depends on where the decimal places are, how many decimal places there are. So the rule is that your final answer cannot have more digits to the right or on the end of the decimal point 
than the original number with the smallest number of digits to the right of the decimal point. So the easiest way to do this is say for an addition or subtraction, let's line them up with the decimal place lining up and then count how many digits we have after the decimal. So this first number we have two digits after the decimal point. The second one we have three digits after the decimal point. So if I add this up, just plug my calculator, here's the answer I get. Now because I've got two digits versus three digits. The thing is you cannot have more than the original but the smallest number of digits regardless of whether or not that's the smaller number. In this case we have two digits in our first number and three digits in our second number so we cannot have more than two digits in our final answer. So we take our final answer and we round it so it just has two digits. So this would round to 102.73. Same rule goes if you're subtracting here. So here we're subtracting, our first number has two digits, our second number has one digit after the decimal, so our final answer cannot have more than one. Now here I have 123.19, I want to hold up just one decimal. This one will round up to two because the number following it is five or greater. So that is the rule for addition subtraction. It has absolutely nothing to do with the number of significant figures. Multiplication division, on the other hand, now it does matter how many significant figures you have. Rules the same, though, as far as you cannot have more digits than the, no than the smallest number of significant figures in any of your starting numbers. It's just instead of looking at the number of spots after the decimal, if there is one, we're looking at the number of significant figures. So in this number, my first number has four significant figures, my second number has four significant Sorry, my first number has two significant figures, my second number has four significant figures. So I cannot have more than two significant figures. So two versus four, pick the smaller number, this the smaller number of significant figures, which is two significant figures. So I need two significant figures. So one, two, leave off the rest, I just have 11 for that number. In this division, one of my numbers has one, two, three, four cinema figures. The other one has one, two, three, four, five cinema figures. So four cinema figures versus five cinema figures. So our final answer cannot have more than four significant figures. Now, when I'm counting cinema figures, remember, leading zeros do not count. So these first two zeros do not count. I want to count off four cinema figures. So I'm going to go to the three, because that's the first digit that is significant, and start counting there. So one, two, three, four, I round at that point. Now the number after the two is greater than five, so that two will round up to three. And there is my rounded number. So to recap, if you're adding or subtracting, you round according to the fewest number of decimal places. If you're multiplying or dividing, you round according to the fewest number of significant figures. Now what about that whole exact versus inexact number we talked about earlier? Exact numbers, I said, have no level of error, so they technically have, you could say, infinite number of significant figures. So for example, if I had three objects that weighed 2.5 grams each and I wanted to figure out the total mass, it would be 3 times 2.5. Because this 3 was three objects, or that is an exact number, we only round according to numbers that are inexact, so we would round to significant figures according to the second number, not the first number. So 7.5 has two significant figures. So this 3, because it was an exact number, has uh, theoretically a limited number of significant figures when we're deciding how to round. Now if you have multiple steps, those ones we saw all just had one step. We added, we subtracted, we multiplied, we divided. The just one step. What if you have multiple steps? Well, if you have multiple steps and you round every single step, then you're going to get something called rounding error. Rounding error is how much error there was when you dropped off the end of the number, when you rounded off. Now, if you do that just once at the end of the problem, then that's an acceptable amount of error that just is the price to pay to round. But if you do that at the end of every single step, then those little bits of error will start compounding on themselves to the point where it becomes one big error. Therefore, it is better to, when you're doing a multiple step process, keep at least one extra digit until the end and then round at the very end. Now, 
when I'm calculating something that has multiple steps, I use a calculator that allows me to store previous answers. And that way I don't have to round it all. I can keep all the digits and do it either in a all one fell swoop or save them all and uh, calculate with all of the digits in there. That's fine, you can do that. Or if you're the kind of uh, a student who likes to write down your answer at the end of each step and then plug that into your calculator, that's fine. Just keep at least one extra digit that you know you. So if you know your final answer needs four significant figures, make sure in each step you're counting out five significant figures and then round to four at the very end. So perform the following arithmetic operations and report the result to the proper number of significant figures. Now this first number is an addition problem, so we're going to round according to the decimal places. So one decimal place here, three decimal places there, so our final answer needs just one decimal place. So, so the answer to A would be 317.5, which is the answer, or sorry, sorry 318.2, which is rounded to just one decimal place. Our second problem there is a subtraction. So we're still going to go by decimal places. I have two decimal places and three decimal places. So I'm going to round to two decimal places. So subtract them, plug in the calculator, this is what we get. Rounding to just two decimal places, we'll keep the seven and the two, but the two rounds up because after it's five, so 0.73. Now here we have an addition problem. Notice here when we were, or sorry, a uh, division problem. Notice here when we were adding, they had the same unit. That's kind of a universal rule. You cannot add or subtract things unless they are in the same unit. If I gave you a volume of 20 liters and I asked you to add 25 milliliters, you wouldn't say 20 plus 25. You would have to make sure they're in the same unit first before you can add them. The same rule does not apply for division, but it will change our unit. So we have 13.5 grams divided by 45.18 liters. So this looks like a density equation. Grams divided by liters or mass divided by volume. So we're calculating the density of something. So our final unit will be grams over liters. So this is a division problem. So we're going to round according to the fewest number of significant figures. 13.5 has three significant figures. 45.18 has four significant figures. So we need just three significant figures. So do the division, get this whole long number in our calculator. Where do we cut it off? Cut it off according to three significant figures because that is the fewest number of significant figures of any of our starting numbers. Again, ignore leading zeros starting at the two. One, two, three. Round off to the eight. And since the number after eight is five or greater, we're going to round it up to a nine. So 0.299 in our unit is gram per liter. Back to D, 6.25 centimeters times 1.175 centimeters. This is a multiplication, so we're going to go by centimeter figures. Centimeters times centimeters will give us centimeters to the second or centimeters squared. Multiply them out. I've got three centimeter figures and four centimeter figures, so I'm going to round to three centimeter figures. So I get this long number in my calculator. I round to just three centimeter figures. So one, two, three, round up to the four, 7.34 centimeters squared. All right, looking at E, this is the one that is tricky. This is an addition problem, which means we're looking at the number of decimal places. But I said you have to be in the same unit that to add or subtract. That includes the same power if you have it written in scientific notation. This first number is times 10 to the power of 2. The second one is times 10 to the power of 3. We cannot add them until they're in the same unit, including the 10 power. So we could either take uh, this number and put it to 10 to the third and change our move our decimal, or we could take this number and move our decimal this way and make this power of two. So let's do that. Let's rewrite this problem, rewrite this number 4.991 times 10 to the third as 49.91 times 10 to the power of two. Yes, this number is not correct scientific notation. Correct scientific notation will only have one point, one, one decimal, Sorry, one digit before the decimal, but it will serve our purposes so we can simply add the numbers together. And now we can see I've got two spaces after the decimal here, two spaces after the decimal here, 
So after I add them, I will keep two spaces after the decimal. So I'll add them together, two spaces after the decimal. Now, this again is not correct scientific notation. Correct scientific notation has just one digit before the decimal, so we're going to have to move that decimal back. So 5.537, and that will make that 10 to the 2nd into a 10 to the 3rd. So that was probably the only one where it was really tricky. These were all single step conversions, or sing single step uh, significant figure problems. Now let's kind of put in the chemistry a little bit. Let's look at a word problem. How would we deal with this in a word problem? Sale problem 1.7 says an empty container with a volume of 9.850 times 10 to the second cubic centimeters is weighed and found to have a mass of 124.6 grams. It is filled with the gas and reweighed, and the new mass of both the container and the gas is 126.5 grams. Determine the density of the gas to the appropriate number of significant figures. Now remember, density is mass over volume. Gases, if you were reading earlier on in the chapter, properties of gases, gases take on the entire volume of the container. Well, the volume of the container is 9.850 times 10 to the second cubic centimeters. So we know that the volume, V, is that 9.850 times 10 to the second cubic centimeters. But the question is, what is the mass? We want the density of the gas, which means we want the mass of just the gas. I have the mass of the container and the gas and the mass of just the container. So I need to do a subtraction here to get the mass of just the gas first. So there's two parts to this problem. The first one's going to be a subtraction, my filled container minus the just contain empty container to get the mass of the gas. So that subtraction will go according to the number of decimal places. And then the second part is a division. So division then will go by the number of significant figures. So let's do the subtraction first. Do the subtraction first. 1.26.5 minus 124.6 gives us 1.9. Now we have one decimal place and one decimal place, so our final answer needs just one decimal place, 1.9. Now I wouldn't. I would keep extra digits here if I needed them. I don't need them, but take note now that this number has two significant figures. So going into the second part of the problem, where we plug it into density as mass over volume, we're looking at a number with now two significant figures. So now this number has two significant figures. We're dividing by the volume, which has one, two, three, four significant figures. So we're going to round according to two significant figures because that is a smaller number of significant figures. So take the number that our calculator gives us, round according to two significant figures, ignoring the leading zeros, starting with the one, one, two significant figures, drop off the three, point zero zero one nine gram per centimeter cubed, or written in scientific notation, one point nine times ten to the negative three gram per centimeter cubed. So that's how to round when you're dealing with a multi-step word problem. Most problems that you'll come across in this course, however, you can look at the numbers in your starting uh, uh, instant, your starting problem, and go by the number of significant figures, since most of them deal more with uh, multiplication, division than subtraction. But for the purposes of this chapter, make sure you're paying attention to each step, how many significant figures there are.